Hey everyone and welcome back to the Hybrid Friends. Today I'm with here with my good friends from Intel, Fleming and Hind. And we will discuss the topic. I think it's just a hype, as always. <laughs> uh, artificial intelligence or AI at the edge. And before we go deeper into the topic, Hint, Fleming, just can you give the audience a short intro to yourself and then what you do at Intel? Yeah, so my name is Hinda Cruz. I am AI inference lead for the EMEA region, so helping our customers in enabling them uh, with the different um, um, products that Intel has, be it in the software uh, domain or, the, or hardware domain, and help them build those applications so that they can uh, go to market with a, with, a, with a robust solution, so to say. I joined Intel around uh, three years back, and prior to that, I worked in different roles in academia and, uh, and uh, industry, uh, and my background is, uh, is computer vision. I hold a PhD in computer vision, and uh, yeah, that's... Uh, that's uh, my background. Excellent. Thanks a lot. And yeah, my name is Fleming Backhaus. I'm part of the Intel Microsoft team, basically. And, and in this team, I am uh, have got a focus on, on Azure. So I'm here the EMEA Sales and Marketing Development uh, Manager uh, based out of Munich. So my job is basically, you know, to work with Microsoft, work with partners, uh, but work as well with end customers to ensure, you know, when they, you know, deploy their workloads in the cloud or at the edge, you know, with Azure Stack HCI, you know, they are using this with as much Intel technology as possible, making sure, you know, they know our solutions and, you know, we help them to optimize and streamline, you know, their installations. This is where, you know, we hope we can add some value to the sales process um, within Azure. Yeah. Thank you so much. And as we talk, talking a lot of hybrid, and now we have all this AI topic, we know that nearly every hyperscaler can now do AI in their clouds, but there are customers asking about AI at the edge. So on at their on-premise, at their own data centers, at their, let's say, remote locations like mineral mines or something like that. Why should, or why are they doing it? Why are they using artificial intelligence at the edge, at edge locations, or even at mobile locations? Yeah, yes. that's a. Sorry, yeah. The, uh, if I if I may take that one. Sure, so basically, um, the 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 demand for edge uh, has. Uh, has come from different uh, uh, requests from the from the customers, right? So especially in cases where we need a, a low latency, right? So we cannot afford sending the data to be processed and then having the results back. For example, there are uh, uh, some industries that for which the privacy and the security is a really key question that they want to keep everything on prem in the edge having the 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 the, the the insight from their AI uh, there and there. Uh, what else? Um, you have the 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 within this that same uh, idea, the regulatory compliance, right? That that follows that privacy and security with with a lot of industries. They cannot send data somewhere to be processed and and then uh, have the results back. And then last but not least, you have the cost efficiency, right? If you can have everything in a in a small device running on uh, on the edge right where the data is then uh, uh, that's that's definitely a, a, a lower uh, total cost of ownership for that particular uh, use case and of course there are lots of other reasons why uh, people are, are 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 going edge but these are the kind of the the, the first things that come to my mind Yes, absolutely. That, that's as well, you know, what I see when I when I work with customers. And to be honest, I mean, you you, you said, Flo, you, you, you see it's a hype. Um, I mean, we are really getting an increased amount of customers, you know, talking about these use cases. And, and as Hin said, you know, really the latency is often, you know, the, the critical point that, uh, you know, makes customers uh, look into edge solutions here for, for AI. Yeah, so I think uh, you covered it very well, Hint. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you already said that. And you said small device, and the point is, if I, I think nearly everyone lo look uh, saw the video from Linus Tech Tips about these huge AI servers presented for I think one hundred thousand US, um, 
that's not something I would put on my edge, just as and declare as a small device. And I think it's also not the, the major edge use case. So how can I tackle the, those large amount of costs for, um, let's say, acceleration cards, GPUs, whatsoever, uh, when it comes to those edge devices? So at least for my knowledge, I I know what you what you would answer, but it, it's, it's like when I think of AI, I always think about a high amount of investment and not a, a lot of money I need to spend on it. Yes, you, you're absolutely right, and I hear this, you know, very often when I when I speak to customers. Um, I mean, to be honest, I think Nvidia did a pretty good job here in, you know, convincing customers that, yeah, well, as soon as you talk about AI, you need you need some of their their hardware, yeah. And of course, uh, you know this. This will then, uh, you know, lead to the fact that these are, you know, potential complex installations. They are expensive. Uh, these days, you know, you have to tackle, you know, the, the supply issues maybe uh, because they are in very high demand. But you know, actually, especially at the edge, um, you know, there are solutions that don't really need specific hardware. There's a lot of stuff you can do these days with just your standard Xeon hardware. Yeah. And I don't know if you if you followed this over the past years, you know, over the last generation, what Intel has done is, you know, successively, you know, every generation we we we, we launched was introduced with some additional AI capabilities. Yeah. And we will probably speak in, in a bit about our latest generation and we show, you know, you know what we've done there and, and why these are these days, you know, really some very viable alternatives for AI at the edge. But but before we go there, I think we, we we probably need to distinguish. I mean, when we talk about AI, we've got these two big building blocks, and we've got training and we've got inferencing. Yeah, so first of all, you know, you hopefully have got massives of, of data where you need to train your model. You know how to how to whatever detect a, a, a fault at one of your installations. Um, you know, this is something which which we are you know not talking about today. We are talking about the majority of the market where you know, inferencing, so basically using these 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 learned models, these trained models, and then do some actions on them. So that that's what's called inferencing. Um, that's what we're uh, focusing here on 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 this call now. Yeah. And maybe Hint, you would like to give some. Yes, that, that you, you got that uh, that uh, dichotomy pretty uh, uh, right actually, because when we speak about AI. It is uh, uh, the two main components. You have the training part, that's where you build your intelligence, you build your model, the, 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 the kind of the algorithm that is able to provide you with the decisions uh, that, that you will need for your uh, 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 work, for your, for your actions. And then you have the inference phase. And the inference phase is basically the phase where you are actually asking that model that you have trained in the training phase to give you answers. So typical scenarios, for example, I don't know, if we take uh, a traffic control, it would be a camera with an edge device that tells you how many cars have passed through this road uh, from this hour to this hour that can, uh, then used uh, be, be used for an, some actionable uh, insight into uh, I don't know we need to um, limit the the, the yeah. traffic there we want we need to this type of thing. I, I right? think I, I so, think that I started in, I saw I saw that in the Netherlands uh, recently. So there was a comparison between Germany, which is not really digitalized, mm -hmm. versus the Netherlands, uh, where you saw in the Netherlands already AI models trained on the traffic lights. Who learned? Okay, there is a lot of amount of traffic coming from, let's say, the city. So I need mm -hmm. to give those cars who are coming from the city a bit more of a green light than the ones coming from the countryside, or even from left, right, cross traffic. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it learned from from the overall traffic coming through the um, the, uh, the the street crosses, and from from as another prediction, which was I think made on regular traffic over the day over time mm -hmm. how the traffic light should be handled handled yeah or... so that's yeah so so here uh, in this particular issue i think we're speaking about two problems so you have first of all you have the detection of the cars 
and that's a typical computer vision problem that is called object detection. So you just detect how many cars are crossing the road. And then once you have that information, you are able to build some actions around that. And this action in this case could be optimizing the routing of the uh, how long should should each uh, red, uh, yellow, uh, green light uh, take uh, each. And, and this is kind of an optimization problem, which is also a kind of in the in the in the uh, layman words, a part of the AI, big AI uh, family of algorithms. But what we see, I mean, where the, the insight is is really direct is with, is when we speak about uh, these types of models like uh, 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 deep uh, neural networks that would handle uh, uh, detection of things or these uh, uh, natural language processing models that would, uh, I don't know, provide you, for example, with the translation of a text or with a, a, a sentiment analysis of the of the text that you have or with a summarization of the text. These type of things. Um, yeah, like we like we have today with Copilot. So Copilot is also uh, watching our call and give me my notes afterwards. <laughs> yes, yes, that, that's a, that's a, that's kind of a more uh, advanced uh, uh, or recent advances in the world of AI because it, it enters in the family of large language models, which is kind of uh, what we call generative AI, as opposed to what I mentioned before, which is kind of discriminative AI. So uh, like when you detect the, 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 the number of cars, what you are, what you are, what you are doing there is you are just giving among a list of things, uh, among a, a list of, of, of attributes, if this is a car, yes or no. You're not generating anything from scratch, so to say. But for the generative AI, the algorithms are able to generate new, uh, be it words, uh, languages, code, uh, etc., that wasn't there before. And that's thanks to uh, uh, lots of uh, advances, uh, mainly the, the, you know the, the use of transformers library, the use of huge uh, amount of compute, uh, especially uh, GPU for training, and and uh, and a lot of um, power consumption as well and enters into place. Uh, yeah, sometimes uh, we we do wonder about the, the 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 sustainability part of that, especially here in Europe. We like to. Uh, uh, you know, to 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 balance these type of things, uh, and that's uh, that's something that is, I think, a lot of uh, our uh, research communities are looking at that as well. How do we uh, decrease the power uh, 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 the power uh, waste or the power consumption needed for training these uh, large language models as such? Uh, uh, it just to pick that up because I had a previous video with Paola Anis from, from my team on the Green Software Foundation, who has an amazing map over Europe where you can see where the energy is produced green versus with coal, gas, whatsoever. And and that's, that's also one thing I think we did, I think we did discuss it, but it would also be one thing for AI. Yeah, if you want to, let's say, train your models where you consume the energy, it can be tra trained basically everywhere, I think in a hyperscaler in your on-premise data center, but it can be then located in a, let's say, greener energy area if you need to consume it. It's not only for a reduction purpose then, it's just just move it somewhere where you can produce it from wind, from air, from waves, whatsoever. Uh, just picking that, that, that green approach up. Um, yeah. But if you say a lot of power consumption for generative, mm -hmm. I would then think, as a my humble opinion or humble thought here, is when we're talking about the edge, you will not have a lot of generative AI. It would then be more of just forgot the name. I said I'm not not an AI expert. Discriminative, discriminative. discriminated AI. So like like have it in my bakery, deciding if I need to have more bread that, or more yeah. more cookies that, today. That is, yeah, that is not necessarily the case because. Uh, let's go back to the to the dichotomy that we did before between training and deployment. So once you have your model trained, right, it's a it's a piece of valuable information, and that piece of valuable information, uh, with especially taking into account the Intel vision for 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 things, 
we can run it on any of our devices, on any of our uh, Intel hardware devices at a very good latency, right? So we've collaborating uh, currently with uh, some customers who uh, are, for example, looking at using a generative AI technology for uh, for the for for the retail uh, experience, right? By displaying, for example, uh, a possible advertisement while they are waiting for their queue, and this is all generated by a generative AI algorithm such as a stable diffusion. I don't know if you've heard of that. That's that basically changes your prompt, which is a text to an image. So these these algorithms they can run on the on the uh, they can run on 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 edge uh, hard hardware yeah. what 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 can't happen is training them on the edge hardware and that's uh, that's what uh, that probably the confusion that um, yeah i said you, you probably do the training on a dedicated hardware yeah um this this takes some time um mm -hmm. and of course i mean the training is normally not done you know as often as the intro i think the inferencing part is of course the the bit which is you know much much more you 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 create a model and then of course you use the model probably hundreds or thousands or millions of times in certain in certain environments yeah but but Flo, I, I would like to come back to uh, you know what what you asked earlier so you know may, maybe we discuss some 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 areas I mean you you, you mentioned generative AI I mean in general we, we we see we see for for AI at the edge I would say you know four big for big use cases, yeah. So you, um, Hint, Hint was mentioning computer vision. I mean, th this is, I think, one of the more popular cases. Um, you know, just to give yeah. you some ideas, maybe in um, in the retail space, you know, monitoring, monitoring, uh, you know, customer interaction or mo monitoring, uh, you know, how many how many people are uh, standing at the queue, or, or maybe monitoring when I when I would like to. Uh, check out automatically my my stuff because you you remember there there are some stores these days which don't even have counters anymore you know yeah. they, they they track they track what you put in your in your in your in your um, uh, case um, or as well you know in 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 factories uh, I mean we've got a lot of discussions with customers who would like to uh, track their their um, their production yeah. Is a certain installation with, which we are doing here, you know, is the the windscreen, for example, is, is this properly installed in the car, or you know, are the bottles which are coming from from uh, you know empty empty and and will be refilled in in, in a moment? Uh, are they are they clean? Are they are they broken? You know, these are all use cases you could do. You could use computer vision. So computer vision certainly one uh, one one aspect, one very very popular aspect. Um, Secondly, you would have things like uh, NLP, national language processing. Yeah? So there may be some 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 chatbots uh, which which are used in your company, you know, to answer some some high level uh, discussions or some high level questions from customers automatically, or maybe using some some reports from from doctors and and try you know similar to what uh, what 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 uh, Copilot just says doing, you know, summarizing maybe some of the uh the uh, the results of, of of a doctor yeah and and, and creating creating some some uh, some text here um then of course we've got generative ai and i think a hint you were talking about this so basically creating things they're not there yet you know from text from video or to text to video to music you know wh whatever else and i think last not least uh we potentially got you know recommender systems you've probably seen this you know if you buy on your favorite online store you know people who bought this uh, you know also bought that you know they're recommending basically 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 other stuff yeah so these are you know high level uh, you know four use cases that could be applicable for for the edge and you know which where the inferencing actually you know could be done on a cpu on the latest student, uh, cpu rather than on a you know dedicated accelerator based hardware uh, which as hint says has got the complexity of um, I mean, the, the system itself is, of course, mm -hmm. more complex. The power consumption will be likely a lot higher. The costs, yeah. So if you can reuse the hardware you got anyway, yeah, um, it's of course a, a big, a big cost implication. And I think the time to market as well, yeah, because, like I said, you, you, you can utilize what, what, what you've got. Uh, you don't need to, you know, purchase and potentially wait for, you know, additional parts to, to, to arrive. And the, yeah, the time to market can be increased by that. So mm -hmm. when when you when you're saying the latest Intel ones, so it, I think it's is it already the fifth gen or is there already something built within the fourth gen um, yes. customers can use? 
So, so, so basically, I mean, as, as I said initially, you know, over the last couple of years, we added accelerators to the Xeon line. Yeah. And so you've got already some AI accelerators on the third generation, uh, which was Ice Lake. But, you know, it really made a very interesting jump when we moved to the fourth and fifth gen. So what, what did we change there? So in the fourth and fifth gen, um, Sapphire Rapids and now Emerald Rapids, uh, we added an accelerator called AMX. Yeah? It's advanced multi uh, advanced. Uh, matrix multiplications, which are, you know, very, very strong accelerators for exactly those use cases uh, that we that we just discussed. And maybe Hint, you can, you know, give a few words, you know, what AMX is doing and why this makes really such a, a big, uh, such a big difference, you know, especially when it comes to performance. Yes. Yeah, so basically in, in, a, in, a, in layman words, what AMX allows us to do is it allows us to do the the uh, set of operations such as additions and multiplication, several of them in one clock cycle, right? And we all know that this uh, this this cumulative sum and multiplication is crucial to uh, uh, all the operations that are linked to deep neural networks, which is pretty much the standard that we are working with as type of, of, of models uh, uh, these days. And uh, one thing to mention is that AMX was built at the level, so these are block uh, 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 computational blocks within the, the CPU itself, but to tap into this, 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 this advantage that we have or this feature that we have, we needed to build on top of it, on top of the of it, a stack of software that is able to take advantage of that feature. And so that's what we call at Intel the compounding effect, right? So when you when you use the, the the capacity of the hardware and make sure you use the software that takes advantage of that capacity. And just to give you an example, especially for the case of inferencing, uh, we have been putting a lot of effort on a, 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 a software that we've uh, released, uh, I think, more than five years ago, it's called OpenVINO. Uh, and what OpenVINO does is that it allows you to uh, take advantage of this AMX uh, uh, feature within within in, in the case of Xeon, but also take advantage of other features that are in other uh, hardware, such as uh, features such as DL Boost, uh, AVX 512, that allows you also to speed that processing. So OpenVINO then what it does is that it takes that model that you created, that neural network, and it kind of optimizes it to the best. How does the, the optimization happen? Well, it happens through, for example, removing some of the layers of the neural network that are not useful for the inference, but rather they were useful for the uh, for the training phase, right? So we remove those. Uh, we can uh, then further um, combine or clap some of the some of the operations together because we can run them uh, uh, at in, in a single time. So instead of running them in series, they can be run uh, uh, um, effectively together. And then other types of optimizations that uh, that uh, that we add is uh, the possibility to quantize your model to further quantize your model. So as most of us know, most of the weights and biases or the data that is stored within your neural networks is in the format of floating point 32. So if you quantize this information to something like floating point 16 or integer 8 or integer 4, you are able to cut both the memory footprint of your model uh, hugely, depending on the quantization that you apply, without a loss of accuracy, right? Without a huge loss of accuracy. And in terms of latency, when you are running the inference, that kind of uh, 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 is, is visible through an improvement of la latency from uh, up to, um, you know, it, it can be huge, the, the, the improvement in latency. So these are uh, the, the ways that we uh, approach this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this serving or this inference of, of models by combining the hardware and the software uh, together to give us the, the, the best results uh, out there. And I gave you OpenVINO as an example, but we have lots of other uh, uh, software tools that, uh, that are also uh, heading in that same uh, direction and have that same philosophy. Yeah, so, uh, sorry, so, so, so Hint, let, let me try to, to uh, repeat what you said uh, to make sure. sure I understand this correctly. So, so basically, you know, you can theoretically take a solution where you've got uh, a finished model that you may be already using, yeah, 
You can mm -hmm. use the free of charge tool uh, called Intel OpenVINO mm -hmm. to basically run this, import this the existing model into OpenVINO. OpenVINO will do some model optimization, some model compressions, and then mm -hmm. you basically can very easily do the inferencing on just CPU hardware. You can you can select you know what is your target hardware. Yeah, OpenVINO will automatically detect potential accelerators like AMX in the latest generation. It will utilize those accelerators. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, basically do do the transition there. And absolutely. of course, absolutely. last but not least, as as you said as well, you can further increase the speed by doing quantization. You know, moving from whatever uh, 32 bit to 16 or to 8 or even 4 bit uh, precision. Yeah, which, like you said, only uses a, a very little bit of of precision, but substantially improves improves the performance here, right? Yep. So, so that that. That would bring me to my next question, or at least answers answered already. So, if I'm already an existing AI customer from one of your friendly friends on the market, mm -hmm. I could just easily migrate or use my model from, let's say, Team Green on mm -hmm. Team Blue with Intel. So, mm -hmm. saying, okay. Use OpenVINO transform it. Is is my short unknowing consumption correct? That is correct. So so, so you are speaking about how is it possible to migrate from a given solution to, or a given provider to another to to us, right? Yeah. 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 So. So so basically that is uh, something that is feasible. Again, uh, it depends on uh, at what level the optimization was performed, right? So if we are speaking about, for example, uh, CUDA code uh, that want that we want to transform to something like uh, the uh, cycle or uh, 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 DPC++, then we can use a tool that is called Cyclomatic that uh, Intel offers. And basically it does the transformation or of your code uh, automatically up to, I think, 95, 98% of the migration would be done automatically for you. You will need to revise some, 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 some uh, stuff here and there, but it's the, the migration is done, uh, is done automatically. So these are for the people who are, who would be, uh, let's say, who would be coding at the lower layers of the stack, right? Looking at the CUDA. Now, in general, from my experience and from my collaboration with customers, most of the uh, uh, people who are involved with these applications, they would work at the application layer, meaning um, Python, uh, some libraries, some hacking face libraries, probably some PyTorch, some on NX, these type of things. And in this case, the migrations is the migration is even uh, uh, straight is more straightforward because the only thing that you need to do is you need to take the model that is doing the inference for you and then optimize it using OpenVINO, right? So you basically pass it through a line of code that that optimizes the model, and then it generates a, 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 a format that is, so to say, more compact, uh, that has the, 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 the architecture of the neural network, it has the weights and the biases, and then with that model, you are then ready to uh, run your inference using the OpenVINO runtime, uh, or you, uh, on, on, on any of the devices that you have available. Of course, there are lots of optimizations that OpenVINO offers you to do in case you have uh, you have different devices. Suppose you have access to a CPU, an integrated GPU, a discrete GPU from Intel, then it allows you to kind of optimize those hardware so that the workload is maximized to the best, right? So that's uh, that's um, that's uh, that's how, uh, um, so to say, the easiest way to to do the migration. And one thing to mention as well is that that some of our customers mention is that. Um, most of these tools, if not 100% of these tools, are all open source. What that means is that there is no uh, no uh, vendor lock in, uh, right? So you can, um, yeah, you, 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 yeah, it, it, it gives you that flexibility, right, to work with the uh, with the uh, with the uh, with the uh, with with the tools, uh, uh, so to say. Yeah. So th yep. then, also basically, gives me the option to 
train my model on on a hyperscaler which only offers let's say nvidia uh, in this case and run it at the edge on an interzeon um commodity hardware basically absolutely absolutely uh yeah using openvino you can you can make sure that all any optimizations that can be thought of uh, was 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 included in that software and who best to think of the optimizations than the the people or the company who built the hardware themselves right um so that's uh, that's the idea another thing to add on to this is that uh, which understandably uh, some developers maybe they are very used to using uh, pytorch for example as their um, coding language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So maybe they feel that they don't want to learn another API with OpenVINO, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So for those types of, of of developers, we also now offer the possibility to use OpenVINO as a backend within your PyTorch. So you don't need to exit your PyTorch, your syntaxes that you are familiar with. You just literally add a line of code that says that OpenVINO is your backup. And for 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 uh, for for uh, for running the inference, and then you keep all your code as is. So that's uh, that's something that a lot of uh, we, we've 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 received a lot of uh, uh, positive feedback for that particular uh, feature. Yeah, I think so. In in general flow, you know, we have got these days support for most of the popular frameworks. Yeah. Um, you mentioned PyTorch. PyTorch indeed has got some extensions to take advantage of this of the functionality in the CPU. I think we've got Onyx, uh, which runs out of the box uh, with AMX support, and uh, uh, I think there are a few the few more which are basically, uh, you know, use usable and optimized for for Intel architecture in this in these days. Yeah. And and that brings me to more or less closing the loop on the on the overall Intel strategy. And correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we see now really more and more investments into the AI space. A lot of uh, much more demand on that. So especially Microsoft is also building it globally more capacity to to run those environments and also building more and more into the product itself. So that will create a high amount uh, or a large of interest into getting those commodity hardware. Sorry for saying that at the edge. So it will. Say it, it feels like we are running into our Bitcoin issue again, and I think especially Intel learned from that. So building a lot of those new factories throughout the next three to four years to provide additional capacity to build their own products, and especially for me as I'm living near one or or if I throw a stone, I, I think I will hit your your building place right now. Uh, in a small city I live, and what I see there, what I see, what I see, what you build here, what you build around the globe, what you're planning for those new facilities. I think especially Intel learned from the past years with focusing on the Asian <coughs> regions with the production now being more in the US, being more in, in, in EMEA, so that we do not run into any, let's say, delivery demand issues in the future as we ramp up with AI. Is that assumption correct? So is, is that really one core of, of the overall industry strategy to build more, not even build the products, build the capabilities, but also build the capabilities to yeah, manufacture your, uh, the, the, pro, uh, the product itself, plus with foundry service, foundry services, those products which are on top or or needed uh, in the aftermarket for uh, for those capabilities. Yeah, to be honest, from my point of view, I don't have a lot of visibility on the reason why the decisions was uh, were made to um, go for this uh, location or not this location. Um, maybe the upper management have their uh, um, uh, reasons. It, it, but, it's uh, not about the location; it's really more of building additional capacity. Where yep. it is located anyway. I know that especially our friends from Bavaria are not that happy about building the facilities <laughs> in the eastern part of Germany, but I am perfectly fine with that. <laughs> Giving a bit yeah, more nope. value to, to eastern Germany, but um, it is really on building more facilities to feed the demand, which I think you predict in the future. 
Yeah, I, th I think you brought up a very good point. And I think during COVID times, we were, you know, learning this the hard way, you know, where we suddenly, where some of the supply chains got broken. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if, if you look at it, there are not many companies these days who can produce semiconductors on the latest notes. Yeah? I mean, at the end of the day, it's Intel, Samsung and, uh, and TSMC. TSM. Yeah. yeah? Those... So these are the big ones and there are plenty of smaller ones, which yeah, likely uh, produce on older nodes. But if you want to have the latest and greatest, these are the three big players. Yeah, and as you pointed out, I mean, most a lot of capacity is at the moment in in Taiwan. Yeah. Um, you know, with all these geopolitical uh, challenges these days. So of course, being more independent from 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 these turbulences, you know, I think it it was mandatory or was very important that you know the US and 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 uh, Europe got together and uh, you know made some very large investments and put a stake in the ground. And as you said, Intel will um, build or is currently starting to build a big fab in uh, in Magdeburg, Germany, which will be, you know, manufacturing on the latest note. Um, you know, next to this, we had some refresh and some extensions in, um, in the US. And I don't know if you followed the press, I think just the other day, uh, uh, you know, we got a, we got a nice, little machine from ASML, you know, the first the worldwide, I think, first yeah. EUV HHA uh, machine, uh, uh, which will basically enable us to, you know, produce on the, you know, 1.2 nanometers, I think was, was, was the latest note. Yeah, I mean, how, how we call these nodes, it's, you know, uh, 20A and 18A, yeah. so A for angstrom, yeah, so you could say it's whatever, 1.8 uh, uh, nanometer, yeah. And of course, the roadmap has been recently disclosed, I think, up to 14A. So there will be, uh, you know, really some very advanced uh, manufacturing processes. And as was recently discussed, uh, Microsoft will be one of our customers. Yeah? So yeah. this will be a very, ex right. uh, very interesting time, yeah. I would assume, especially as we are nearby, or our data, or the Microsoft data centers are nearby with Berlin, Frankfurt, and now the Cologne area. And yes. foundry services offered, especially in Magdeburg, there will also be the AI chips from Microsoft. Maybe I even don't know, I, or I don't know either. Uh, could be the manufactured here. So um, yeah, very that, very likely possible. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yes. That, that's really. I like especially the joint approach between Intel and Microsoft, not seeing them as a competitors, especially if it's, it's really also being those those partners in crime here. Yes, and, and and you know maybe maybe to make sure you know we we, we are on the same page here. So I mean we're we're not saying you know there is no market for discrete AI chips. That's of course not what we're saying. But uh, you know I think the realization is that you know for many many workloads, you know what you're doing, uh, you know the capabilities. Yeah in your standard Xeon chip is more than adequate to run those workloads. You don't need as, you know, immediately you, you're doing some AI words. You don't know, you don't need to immediately, you know, purchase this accelerator cards. Yeah? yeah. You know, depending on, of course, your workload, maybe it's it's such a, uh, a demanding workload that, you know, buying such an accelerator is justified and is indeed a good, a good, a good decision. Yeah. But, you know, a, a lot of use cases can be really be, you know, resolved by, Using the capabilities in your standard Xeon hardware these days, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and that brings us maybe back us to the uh, start of our session today. It's again a good hybrid approach, having those learning models, this huge amount of accelerate, uh, accelerated hardware you need, rented for the certain amount of time you need it, but running your your model or running the increments on premise on commoditized Xeon hardware makes best sense because when do you um, train a model basically and how often do you need it and how often do you need to train it? Some some companies I know, so like like I, I know a few bakeries, it was a weird, we train our models once a month mm -hmm. on, the, on the latest month uh, data on the month and then mm -hmm. we put everything back on prem. It's like like a me as an old infrastructure guy patching my servers, building my building my patch, building my update, and run, then put it on my service itself. So, I said, with my limited knowledge on AI, I just tried to close my loop here <laughs> for the conversation. Um, so, from that, I would say we we provided a lot of insights into the old overall topic today. 
-hmm. We learned a lot. I would put everything I know. Fleming has a lot of those stuff on presentations and on links. I would put everything in in, in, the, in the notes, in the description. And I think you would also be here if we have the audience asking comments and also having uh, want to see a bit more deeper dive on the product portfolio itself. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. If there is any need for a second session, no problem. What do you think, yeah. Fleming? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, um, you know, potential customers who are watching this uh, this the show, you know, feel free to to to, to get in touch with us. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. Flo, I think you know we we met the first time, you know, uh, during your fast track. Uh, yeah. Role basically, yeah. I mean, there's a there's a similar service uh, at, at Intel. We we call this APOC, Azure Performance and Optimization Center. And what this is, it's a it's a group of highly skilled engineer who are basically able to help customers to deploy mm -hmm. their workloads at Azure, you know, on premise and, and and in the cloud. Yeah. So we've got technical resources which are happy and able to you know look into this. And yeah, if a customer is interested, you know, to try it out, to try a POC with us, and you heard from Hint, you know, it's not a it's not a super complex thing, yeah. So it's something you can probably, uh, you know, evaluate relatively quickly. You know, reach out to us. We are we are more than happy to, to have a chat with you. Mm -hmm. and yeah, of if course, you want to see a demo or something, yeah. we can we can also plan for that. And I also know from from my friends at Dell and HP and and Lenovo, they they also if together with the APOC team and also with with us or with for themselves or other partners, they also offer. Demo and 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 loan hardware to really try those things in real, and you always have yeah. the option to run it on the on the hyperscalers, and that's that's really one really good thing. It's there. You can try it. You can try your use case. The only thing is, that's one thing we discussed in our team right now. So we try to build our own bots, our own learning uh, learning models for our daily use. Have your data ready. Always think, if you put garbage in, you will get garbage out. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, I mean the easiest thing could be, of course. I mean, like, like we like we discuss in this in this call. Um, if you've got an existing model or at the moment, you know, trying to port this to, to a to a Xeon architecture is something that can easily be done. But of course, you're right. I mean, if you start from scratch, yeah, uh, the data is of course very very important. Yeah, the that's that's true. Yeah. With that, I would like to close for today. Thank you so much for being with me. And for everyone else, use the comments, ask your questions. I will put the LinkedIn profiles to him and to Fleming on the notes. So thank you so much for being with me. Thank Thanks you. A Thanks a lot for the invitation. Thanks a lot. And of course, like I said, we could have gone uh, go a, a lot more deeper, but yeah, I think for an initial overview, I hope for that was uh, that was useful. Thank you so much. And for okay. everyone else, goodbye. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.